If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have noticed that this episode is a week delayed. But if you want to get early access to our episodes, consider becoming a paying member. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you for all your support. Bill Nye is a hero of science, a man whose passion, born of deep knowledge and human concern, has inspired millions. I was delighted when the board of the Centre for Inquiry decided to give him the Richard Dawkins Award for 2023. It was a real pleasure to present the award to him. After my speech, I had an onstage conversation with him. Not being American, I haven't seen any episodes of Bill Nye the Science Guy on television. <laughs> but if you had asked me who is the Science Guy, I would instantly have known the answer. That's a measure of his international fame. My knowledge of his work is largely through reading three of his books, uh, Unstoppable, Everything All at Once, and undeniable. <laughs> All three are truly excellent. I read them as audiobooks. I've become quite a connoisseur of audiobooks. I hold strong views about them. They're often read by actors chosen for their nice voices, but they often don't understand the sentences they're reading. <laughs> In particular, you have to understand the previous sentence in order to know which words to emphasize in the next sentence. Or they're read by authors who know what they're talking about, but sometimes have rather monotonous, unlistenable delivery. Bill Nye is a walking definition of the phrase best of both worlds. He really, really knows what he's talking about, and his delivery is up there with the best of professional actors. He not only knows his science, he has the charisma to put it over. I have read the following statement by Francis Collins, the former director of the American National Institutes of Health. An exceptionally nice man, by the way, who unfortunately happens to be a religious nut. <laughs> he said, it doesn't always seem that science is in the room where it needs to be. And so gifted teachers of science with a lot of credibility, a sense of humor, an ability to convey complex information are needed more than ever. And so, Bill Nye, we need about a thousand more of you. <laughs> yes, we do. For Bill Nye, with his wonderful rhyming appellation, science guy, is much more than a science educator. He's a science savior. Now, savior is not a word I use lightly. <laughs> it's a word more likely to appeal to Francis Collins than to this audience. But a secular definition is someone who saves something, often a cause, and is venerated for it. Bill Nye, the science guy, is that figure. His Science Guy television series won 19 Emmy Awards, American television's highest honor. But more than accolades, Bill Nye won acolytes. And I mean that in a good way, the best way possible. He sparked an interest in science among millions of young people and undoubtedly inspired thousands to consider a career in science. Bill's unique combination of comedic hijinks, he was a stand-up comedian at one point, and clarity in making complicated science easy to understand draws in young viewers to be entertained and educated at the same time. His technique is so disarmingly successful that his programs are often shown in science classrooms to this day. No wonder Bill is the most sought after speaker at national science teacher conferences, where thousands of American science teachers cheer on this master teacher. And Bill jokes right back at them, I understand I've been teaching a lot of your classes this year. <laughs> He's also a stirring orator who made an inspiring speech at the 2016 Reason Rally in Washington, an orator driven by his passion for science and for what science can do to save the world. <laughs> One of his favorite phrases, 
signified by a rhetorically raised voice. For that is his other passion, saving the world from the looming disaster brought about by human greed and short-sightedness. He has exactly the right combination of pessimism and optimism. Pessimism in the shape of an utterly clear-sighted vision of the calamity of man-made climate change. Optimism in the shape of a scientist, more specifically an engineer's, can-do spirit. The problems are formidable, but science has formidable power to solve them. Unstoppable brims over with ingenious suggestions for how to harness the sun's energy, both directly by trapping solar radiation and indirectly in the form of wind power. There are highly imaginative plans for manipulating the world's albedo, for harnessing tidal energy, for harvesting solar energy out in space and beaming it back to Earth. It's no wonder he's such a great teacher. He has the inner fire, the passion, which inspires young minds, and he does his homework. He's obviously a hard worker who enjoys his work as well he might, not just because people enjoy what they're good at, but also because science and the promotion of science are about as enjoyable as it gets. Although trained as an engineer, his knowledge and enthusiasm embrace all the sciences. In my own field of evolution, he wrote a wonderful book, Undeniable, which grew out of his debate with the farcical Ken Ham. <laughs> there is a case to be made against dignifying these idiots, against paying them the compliment of bothering to debate with them. I've watched a recording of the debate, and Ken Ham is as idiotic as they come, <laughs> but I think Bill did the right thing by not telling him so to his face, but instead <laughs> quoting the evidence. The crux of that debate between the two came down to a question asked of each of them about what evidence would make them change their minds. Ken Ham, not surprisingly, rejected the entire premise that anything could shake his biblical literalism. He answered almost every question with, I have a book. Whereas Bill, evincing the mind of a scientist, offered up a litany of ways from fossils being in the wrong rock strata to the speed of light and the laws of physics suddenly changing 6,000 years ago and demonstrating for all to see the limitless horizons of science. Science, with its endemic self-correcting mechanism and humble approach to knowledge, in contrast to the hidebound, ossified, puffed-up confidence of goat herder religion. <laughs> As Bill so aptly notes, it wouldn't matter if there are the likes of Kenham in the world if it didn't stunt the minds and deflate the curiosity of so many people. Bill's activism goes beyond debating nincompoops. <laughs> he, he leads the Planetary Society, a space exploration and promotion organization founded by Carl Sagan. As a side note, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry's first iteration, known as PSYCOP, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation into Claims of the Paranormal, was also jointly founded by Carl Sagan. Bill took a class from the great astronomer when he was an engineering student at Cornell University, and he has credited Carl Sagan with inspiring him to bring science to everyone through popular entertainment. A few years ago, the Planetary Society, under Bill's leadership, launched its solar sail mission, in which a space probe is propelled like a great racing clipper in the sky by the solar wind. Bill declared at the launch, Professor Sagan, this one's for you. As I mentioned before, Bill is a leader in the fight against those who reject human-caused climate change. He uses his celebrity to bring attention to the cause. And to his unending credit, Bill is not afraid to appear on stations such as Fox News, where climate change denialism is rampant. He has committed himself to this fight, as he has many other battles in defense of science, by using his remarkable combination of wit, charm, humor, and charisma, armed with a boatload of facts and evidence, and quick-wittedness to respond to hostile objections. His recent series is The End is Nigh. Now, there's a pun that actually works. By the way, if I may offer a little bit of advice, I would lay off the puns. In <laughs> <laughs> 
there is, there's one, I mean, I love the humor, in the, but there's, there's one magnificent place where Bill is describing his house as an example of how to, um, to, how to design a house that's sort of eco-friendly. And comes to a bit where he's at the end sitting on his porch, and you, and you get a feeling he's sitting on his porch about to enjoy a, a cool glass of white wine, but instead he's sitting on his porch yelling at the cars for driving too fast. <laughs> And I love that little, that little, <laughs> uh, um, anti-climax, I suppose. No, well, climax, really. Uh, 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 instead, instead, instead of the, 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 the white wine looking at the, at the sunset, this magnificent outburst. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the end is nice, is a, is a great pen, pun. It actually works because the message of terminal catastrophe is so disturbing. It isn't even trying to be funny. It's deadly earnest, but characteristically, Bill uses apocalyptic pessimism as a vehicle to educate us in science. Past winners of this award include Neil deGrasse Tyson, Cosmos's co-creator Androm, Penn and Teller, Stephen Fry, Stephen Pinker, Tim Minchin, and many other illustrious scientists, thinkers, and entertainers. It's given to, a, quote, a distinguished individual from the worlds of science, scholarship, education, or entertainment who publicly proclaims the values of secularism and rationalism, upholding scientific truth wherever it may lead. No one exemplifies this commitment better than Bill Nye. As he has said, science is the best idea humans ever had. And it's my view that giving Bill this award is one of the best ideas the Center for Inquiry Board has had. Wow. Somebody asked him once if it would be a good idea for scientists to run the country. He said, no, we need politicians with empathy, negotiating skills, and the charisma to carry the country with them. Well, yes, we do. But if such politicians were scientifically educated rather than lawyers, <laughs> how could that not be an improvement? <laughs> if they were literate in all the sciences, not just narrow specialists, if they were steeped in the sort of critical thinking that this conference is all about, isn't it bloody obvious the world would be a better place? If their science gave them a realistically pessimistic vision of the serious problems that lie ahead, coupled with an equally clear, optimistic, positive vision of how to solve them, yes, the more I think about it, the more obvious it becomes. Why not? Bill Nye for president. <laughs> Yes. It's my honor to give you <clears throat> this award. Um, 2023 Richard Dawkins Award to Bill Nye for exceptional service in the fight for reason and science. And on the back is a quote from Carl Sagan. Our passion for learning is our tool for survival. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you all. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Dawkins, that's uh, 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 quite an introduction. Uh, I, uh, this means a great deal to me. Uh, you know, when you receive uh, an award from your peers, it, it's especially meaningful. And it's very nice in this room to be among friends. <laughs> uh, I, uh, a lot of people talk about uh, the selfish gene. Fantastic, your writing is fantastic, and so on. I have had uh, terrific experiences with God delusion. Thank you, I've given it to many people in the hope that they join our merry band and leave their miserable, uh, unhappy bands. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but the one that really got me is the ancestor's tale. 
And uh, I just got to tell you, so uh, that book was extremely influential. And, you know, as a mechanical engineer, naturally, I have very clear and uh, thorough understanding of evolution. <laughs> But I uh, got very interested in the formal, uh, the formal uh, description of evolution and this whole idea that really came to me uh, when I started attending skeptics meetings in Seattle, this idea of claims that can be tested and, uh, and uh, how we know the world. And so you have been a tremendous influence on me and to get this award named for you means uh, more than I can readily say. So thank you very much. Now, I, I, uh, I was struck by your remark when you said pessimism and optimism in balance. Now look, everybody, we are living at an extraordinary time. You know, if you like to worry about things, this is great. <laughs> but you have to be optimistic. If you're not optimistic, you're not going to get anything done. If you go into, I don't know if you guys, I know you're all skeptics, hard nerds, but there's a baseball game going on in the next week or two. And those teams are optimistic. They think they're going to win the game. If they don't, they'll lose, for crying out loud. So yes, this is a critical time in human history. One might argue the most critical time since uh, there were just a few thousand of us in uh, the savannah in Africa. I mean, we have a chance to uh, just tremendously lower the quality of life for billions of us if we're not careful. On the other hand, working together with the process of science, we can celebrate the PB&J the passion, beauty, and joy, and the J-O-D, the joy of discovery. And we can, my friends, change the world. So thank you. Back to you. Bill, science can tell us what is the right thing to do. The problem, of course, is persuading the world to adopt the policies which science tells. It's a political problem. How are we going to solve it? Well, we're going to have this conference. Yeah. And then, you know, if each of us tells two other people and they tell two other people, then pretty soon, you know, by the time we get to 2 to the 11th, we'll have the whole place. But there's much in that, there's much in that everybody. Uh, what we think of as critical thinking and, uh, what, and when I was in school may have been called logic or logical reasoning is... A really important idea, and you mentioned politicians. I claim that, now look, I'm from the States. I'm from the U.S. I grew up here. I don't know any better. But I, I have traveled the world a little bit. And say what you will, the U.S. is the most influential uh, culture. I mean, you know, there's Disneyland everywhere. Uh, but along that line, I claim the guys... Uh, who wrote the Constitution and whoever it was that influenced them uh, were nerds. And they were trying to come up with a system, a system of government, that had built into it change. You know, I just think how those conversations would have gone in colloquial terms <laughs> with, you know, some of their British buddies. Uh, so you're going to have a king, right? No, no, we're not going to have a king. Dude. Come on. You're going to have a queen. No, we're not going to have a queen. No, no. Well, who's going to be? Well, we're going to change it every four years. No, that'll never work. And maybe they're right. We change it every eight years normally. Uh, but this idea is terrific. And, you know, through the Planetary Society, I now go to the offices of members of the U.S. Congress and Senate. And it was just a month ago, uh, third week of September, we had our day of action. And we were on Capitol Hill, 105 people who pay their own way to Washington, D.C. Uh, to meet with their members of Congress. And so I was in, one day, I was in Chuck Schumer's office and Ted Cruz's office. And these guys don't get along about anything. 
but they do get along about the importance of space exploration and funding NASA and so on. So I believe, perhaps in kooky fashion, delusional fashion, that we can find common ground and move forward. And this common ground is going to be through science. And you can meet several members of Congress. I met, I had 21 meetings in two days. But you can meet members of Congress and their staffs, staff people, who are unaware of Article I, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution. And by the way, the US Constitution is now available in paperback. <laughs> uh, Article one, oh, Article and Section 8 is kind of the miscellany, other jobs of Congress. Article 7, I mean, uh, uh, Article 1, Section 7 is about the Postal Service. So anybody who tells you we're going to close the post office is not paying attention. Are you high? We're not closing the post office, for crying out loud. But Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 refers to the job of Congress is to promote the progress of science and useful arts. It's in the Constitution. And to me, useful arts refers to 18th century description of engineering, using science to make stuff, bridges, buildings, uh, plows, what have you, and of course, weapons. But uh, people are unaware of that. And the word science was extant in 17... Uh, 86 and 91 when they finally signed it all. But the word scientist apparently didn't come along until about 1830. It's really remarkable. So uh, it, is, uh, it is an honor and, and uh, a remarkable thing to be living on Earth right now. This is the most exciting time in human history. As messed up as things seems to be, seem to be, we are making more discoveries more rapidly. We are engaging more people. We are raising the standard of living of more women and girls than ever in history. And so let's go, people. It's true. Let's get her done. Let, let's talk a bit about the Planetary Society, which is good, which I, I think is in, inspiring. Um, and um, in, I mean, I, I, I love the. the you're sailing through the, using the, the cosmic rays. Oh, that is amazing. The, um, the, the, the solar wind, is, presumably, is it? To, to, so to, got to, I got to point out, and uh, don't get me wrong, I got to meet him a few times. Carl Sagan was on The Tonight Show. Oh, did you guys hear about Carl Sagan? He was, uh, <laughs> he's got name checked quite a bit today, uh, as well he should, but he mentioned solar wind. <laughs> the, the thing that propels the solar sail is just photons. The solar wind is uh, barely a hundredth of the impulse or momentum of, of sunlight at, at that uh, when you're in space. So you guys, it was apparently Johann, Johannes Kepler who observed the comet that later came to be called Comet Holly and noticed that the tail always points away from the sun, whether you're coming in or going out. And he, he reasoned that there's something about sunlight that one day humankind would sail sunbeams the way we sail winds on the sea. And this is really quite an insight. And so Carl Sagan and these guys, Bruce Murray, who was head of the Jet Propulsion Lab at, during the Viking and Voyager missions, he's a very influential guy, and Lou Friedman, who's still around, he's an orbital mechanics guy at the Jet Propulsion Lab, tried to get a solar sail mission to catch up with Comet Holly, the very same comet. And uh, it got canceled. Remember the handshake in space where the Soviet space program and the U.S. space program had an astronaut and a cosmonaut shake hands? And that way, there's never be any more conflict between these two, uh, <laughs> these two governments or uh, value systems. I'm kidding, uh, sort of. But the idea was really good. Anyway, the, the solar sail got set aside. And... Uh, Carl Sagan did not live to see the solar sails fly. We flew in 2014 and then 2019. And the thing was a success. Is there anybody here who's not a member of the Planetary Society? I mean, you can be honest. I'm kidding. Of course, you should all join at planetary.org. I see a T-shirt here in the front row. So we, uh, we advanced space science and exploration, and that mission 
A uh, mission is space talk for rocket ship thing. Uh, uh, was really inspirational, and so I'm really I really appreciate that you appreciate it because we built it. We have fifty thousand members around the world. And it's actually out there. I mean, you've actually done it. We did it. Yes. And we got it to deploy. You know the. Other solar sails have had difficulty deploying. You know, get it, you guys, uh, if you spend some time studying James Webb or JWST, it really just getting the thing to work, uh, unfold, is quite a deal in itself. Nothing, space, it just doesn't work the way you think it would in when the gravity field where you can walk up to it with something like WD-40 and help it. You know? <laughs> It's really a subtle thing. And so we got it to deploy, and we proved that we could re increase orbital energy. And uh, we took these astonishing pictures. If you guys go to our website, and uh, we got these cameras from an organ a company called the Aerospace Com Corporation. Where did you get the idea for the name? That's brilliant. <laughs> anyway, they're at the end of the runway there at LAX, and they gave us some cameras. They make a lot of slow cameras. And uh, ones for use for situational awareness. And uh, the pictures really are spectacular. Uh, everybody who flies in space is affected. Everybody says you get the overview effect and you see how fragile the Earth is. And so I believe those pictures help us appreciate that point of view. How, how, far, does it, how far does the, does the effect work? How far from the sun can well, you this, get? Well, a lot has been written about this. So. Uh, excellent question. So JAXA, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, there's a penchant in uh, Japanese culture to use romaji, you know, Roman letters. <laughs> so JAXA uh, has this mission going out to Jupiter, a solar sail mission. And you get much past Jupiter, it gets, it's, it gets less and less practical. But people have talked a lot, you know, visionaries, uh, building a sail that doesn't work with uh, visible light photons, but with uh, photons at other wavelengths and the solar wind, the stream particles, and be a big wire mesh like, like the shielding on a microwave oven, and you'd go way out. It's acceler accelerating all the time. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> night and day, but you're in space. There's no night. And, uh, and the other uh, thing about solar sails, it really, right now, is the only technology anybody's thought of that you could use to go to another star system, yeah. which is not necessarily practical, but uh, a remarkable thing to think about. And the trick would be to put have, have a laser. Yeah, I guess you'd take a half dozen Hoover dams, and you'd build a laser system to push it. But some calculations indicate it would take more than all the electricity produced on Earth for five seconds or something. And then people talk about putting a laser system on the far side of the moon and, uh, and give it a, get a solar panels and give it a push. But this is extraordinary. And if you are at Alpha Centauri, on Alpha Centauri uh, 4, or wherever that planet is, and these guys have sent you a spacecraft going at some appreciable fraction of the speed of light, and it hits something, <laughs> you would be really unpopular other civilization. And so, you know, the old in physics, you know, you can stop a locomotive with a mosquito if it's going fast enough. And so um, people talk about a solar sail that would barely be a square centimeter and send it all the way, to, you know, with a laser. Okay, it's visionary, but... We prove that you could do it. There's some missions that solar sail is just ideal. And uh, we talked about earlier uh, when, you know, there's, when you're a kid, there's two things, space and dinosaurs. Well, when I was in second grade, uh, my teacher, Mrs. McGonagall, was compelled to read from a book. The reason the ancient dinosaurs went extinct is they had small brains. And so the mammals took all the dinosaur food. And I remember, I was a little kid, but I remember she, her heart wasn't in it, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, if, I mean, I've done this, but if you're a Tyrannosaurus, or a Tyrannosaurus, <laughs> and, and you come on a rabbit, you know, I mean, yeah. that's it. You know? yeah. And so she knew that there was something wrong with that. But, <laughs> In my lifetime, you guys, we found the convergence of 
of space and dinosaurs, where the asteroid is almost certainly what finished them off. And it is the only preventable natural disaster. And so what we would do with a civilized civilization is have a solar sail spacecraft about 7.7 AU run the orbit of Venus that would look out and look for asteroids. And in a very diligent way, we're going to have near-Earth object surveyor, near surveyor, and that's going to be a great mission, but we take it up a few notches. And looking for an asteroid, as the hilarious joke goes, is like looking for a charcoal briquette in the dark. It's very difficult to see in visible light. But in the infrared, they glow at a whopping 200 Kelvin, you know, uh, quite a bit below freezing. And you would find these things, and then you could, society could plan 20, 30 years to give them a nudge. And I was in, uh, I was in at APL. You guys know APL Applied Physics Lab? So JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, is in Pasadena. Applied Physics Lab is in, Mar in Maryland. Uh, and if you work at JPL, your paycheck comes from Caltech. If you work at APL, your paycheck comes from Johns Hopkins University. And um, uh, you don't hear that much about APL because they also make a bunch of spy stuff. <laughs> and, but they did the Pluto mission, New Horizons, and they did DART, Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And I was there, man, and it was cool. You know, they ran the spacecraft right into another, except in space, there's no noise. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they gave the thing a nudge, and it, it was Really cool, because the, the extraordinary thing about that mission, technically, was you couldn't send it uh, guidance information from here. The time, the delay, with, even at the speed of light, is too long. So it had to find its way in, and it did. The longest journey starts with a single step. We can deflect an asteroid. Don't, you don't want to send Bruce Willis. That's not the way to go, because <laughs> you might break it up, and it would be even worse. You'd have a like, buckshot instead of a single projectile. I, I was pleased to meet uh, the astronaut Rusty Schweikert, who's very... Oh, God, he's the guy. Yeah, huh? and he explained to me that the, the asteroid that's, that's coming for us is not going heading straight for us like it's a speeding bullet. It's, it's in orbit, and you have to change the orbit to just give... by giving it a nudge, either slightly speed it up or slightly slow it down. Yes. Yeah. Um, exactly. And, and um, that was quite a revelation to me, and he explained that you only have to change the velocity by a few meters per second. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's, it's rocket science. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, you guys, no, rocket science is the real thing, man. You know, um, two things. First of all, you know, this is, this is, so let's just do this thought experiment, people in fifth grade. You know how much the astronauts weigh and their uh, food source, formerly Tang, and, um, that could be an older reference lost on some of the younger listeners. <laughs> and, um, and you know uh, how much the rocket itself weighs. And every moment that goes by, after you light the engine, every moment that goes by, the rocket weighs less. Right? Every moment. So how much fuel do you start with? It's a heck of a problem. And so Newton and Leibniz figured this out and invented calculus. That's quite a thing. And then uh, and two different guys on different parts of Earth figured out the rocket equation at about the same time. It's really a remarkable thing. But along that line, a Rusty Schweikert story, if I may. It's not very long. If you go to um, the Chabot Space and Science Center, which is now a NASA facility in, uh, up the hill from Oakland, California, they have a bunch of space artifacts, and they have a real Apollo landing simulator, lunar excursion module simulator. And a guy I went to college with, Dan Miller, he's very successful, he's an electrical engineer, and he came up with Ask Jeeves. Do you remember Ask Jeeves? No, and he sold it as ask.com, he does, he does very well. But he was also, obviously, the president of the uh, American Pinball Association, obviously, and he has played a lot of pinball. And he's a guy, electrical engineer of a certain age, and he loves the relays and all the chunk, 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 you know, of the uh, bumpers and stuff. And he's played the Apollo astronaut, the Apollo lunar lander game many, many times. 
Anyway, and he has trouble. You can set it to different difficulties. There's a lever, a, a toggle, and he has a lot of trouble winning. Rusty Schweikert walked up to that machine at this astronaut autograph night. Boom, put it right down. <laughs> it's just muscle memory. He must have played that thing thousands of times yeah. as an astronaut. Yeah. You know? It's very cool. I just went, wow, these guys are real deal. Yeah, the asteroid thing, I didn't believe. But after I saw him play that, you know, early video game, man, I was on board. That was great. So back to you. There, there are some scientists who think that it's a waste of money to send people into space. And I was impressed by your objection to that. I mean, you're one of the few people I've heard of actually justifies sending people into space. Well, let's talk about a couple things. Uh, the, everybody appreciate that landing on the moon, and I was there, I, I mean, by that, I was here. Uh, <laughs> but I was alive, and I was watching it, and it was amazing, and all that. Just everybody. It, what, we learned more about the age of the Earth. We learned about the formation of the moon. There's even a type of mineral uh, named after uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the base where it's landed. Dude. Tranquility ite, yeah, right, is even uh, mineral. Uh, that's good, but it was the Cold War, everybody. That's why people went to the moon, and it was a race, and everybody sort of figured, everybody in the world came to understand that whoever got a person there first would be the winner somehow. And sure enough, a few years later, the Soviet Union went out of business. I mean, and, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it, seriously, you guys, they, it, uh, it was our way of doing things, or U.S. way of doing things, or Western way of doing things versus this thing, that, this other technique. And so uh, that was great. But knocked on from that are all these amazing discoveries and this tradition of space exploration and all that. But then from a practical standpoint, uh, it has been estimated that what our best Martian rovers do, you know, we have uh, spirit, we have... As far as rovers, we have Sojourner, Spirit, Curiosity, uh, sorry, a Spirit Opportunity, of course, Curiosity, and now Perseverance, all up there. They're worth, by the way, altogether, they're worth about four billion U.S., and they're not even locked. <laughs> Somebody could just walk up to them. <sighs> you know, you'd think they would have thought of that, you know. But what our best... <laughs> That's a solid joke, come on, that's, that's solid. What our best rovers do, driven by our rest, best rover drivers, directed by our best rover geology science people, what they can do in a week, a human geologist, I've dressed properly, uh, could do in about five minutes. Some people say a minute, because the geologist knows what to look for, picks up the rock, hits it, this and that. And then, there's a lot of effort being put in to bring samples back from Mars. And you know, you can buy Mars rocks. They're rare, but they're not that rare. I mean, you, there are people who collect them, and the place to get them apparently is Antarctica. You go on the ice, you know, when a rock is found on the ice, there's nobody going down there, you know, throwing them. <laughs> they came from space, but the kind of rock that can survive an impact on Mars thrown into space, woo, 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 once again, and lands on Earth, can get through the Earth's atmosphere and make it to the ice in Antarctica, is a different type of rock than you would find in a river delta that used to be very wet, a mud rock, as they call it. So we want to bring back mud, mud rocks, extraordinary expense, a lot of messing around. But if a human geologist were there, he'd get her done. You know, he'd look at it, and the dream, you guys, what keeps me in the game is I want to find evidence of life or, stranger still, something alive on another world. And if we could find fossilized pond scum, stromatolites of Mars, I mean, it would change history, everybody. Absolutely. Everybody would feel differently about being alive yes. on Earth. And that is a worthy quest. And if you go up to people on the street or here, and say indoors, where it's always cold. Uh, <laughs> you could say, 
how much is the, is the budget of NASA in the States? And people would say, oh, it's 10%. No, it's 0.4%. And the discoveries that are made change the world. And, and I remind everybody, people talk about, well, commercial, commercial space companies are doing everything that NASA did. No, I mean, building rockets is different. There's no business case for driving around on Mars looking for evidence of water flow and then ultimately life. This would be, this is an extraordinary thing. And Mars is but one example. You know, uh, Europa has twice as much ocean water as Earth. It's a moon of Jupiter. Discovered, the sea, the ocean there was discovered by a woman, by the way, Margie Kilvelson. Kilvelson. And then you guys, if you heard about phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus, I mean, what was it? What the fact? Is that the name of the book? I mean, you guys, the, the main way we find this gas on Earth is um, given off by microbes. And the Venusian surface, by the way, you know, <laughs> the adjective for having the characteristics of and pertaining to Venus is Venusian. Originally, it was venereal. Uh, <laughs> I didn't write, it's not my idea. Anyway, uh, the surface of Venus is unbelievably hostile. I mean, it's just no way. Uh, it's, you know, it melts lead and all that. Nine, 90 times the atmospheric pressure. The atmosphere is so thick. Thank you. <laughs> it's so thick that it has tidal effects. It's like having an ocean of thick air. Uh, but the atmosphere is quite temperate. It's like 30 Celsius or something. Are there Venusian aeroplankton? These would be creatures that live in the atmosphere of Venus. Whoa, dude. And so that is an extraordinary thing worth investigating. And then Enceladus, the moon of Saturn that seems to have water and carbon dioxide shooting off into space all the time. These are extraordinary things. And if NASA's 0.4% of the federal budget, the planetary science budget is barely 9% of that 0.4%. And so it's an extraordinary thing to invest in. And um, with that said, we're heeding that Carl Sagan talked continually about comparative planetology. When you compare the climates of Mars to Earth to Venus, you see that we are changing things very fast. And it's time to get to work. Time to get to work, Richard. Well, let's talk about um, energy now then. Um, coal, I know, is a great bugbear of yours for very good reason. And there's, in, in one of your books I've just read, there's a lot about um, re renewable energy and fascinating ideas about albedo of the Earth and, and um, using tidal power, wind power, and things like that. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer, and uh, thank you, mechanical engineer. You can tell, you know, my pants don't reach the, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're an engineer. <laughs> hey, can you fix the blender? Yeah. Yeah, hold the plug in the wall firmly, and then put the blender under some cold running water. <laughs> It's really funny. So uh, anyway, when you have a hammer, every problem is a nail, all right? So when you're a mechanical engineer, you look at the world. What we need are wind turbines, cool wind turbines. You know, you guys, does anybody live around wind turbines? Keep in mind, they're, I, my first job out of school was at, on 747s at Boeing. Don't worry, <laughs> it's very well supervised if you're ever on a 747. But the modern wind turbines are wider across than that airplane, wider across than a 777. And uh, the tip speed is really fast. And uh, they're huge machines that can produce a lot of electricity. And so if it has been argued that if you had about four times as much wind and solar and energy storage as we have now, right around four times, we could power North America uh, renewably. That's an extraordinary claim, but uh, it just shows you that as the price of 
renewable electricity, wind and solar principle, principally, and you mentioned geothermal, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, tidal energy. If we did all that, uh, we could greatly lower our carbon footprint very, very quickly. But getting people on board with it is uh, a difficult problem, and some people don't want the wind turbines. But the things that go wrong with wind turbines are so much less catastrophic than things that go wrong with uh, uh, oil wells and methane leakage, and of course, everybody's bugaboo, nuclear energy. Uh, so uh, the promise of these things is fantastic, but what we need is to get everybody on board, uh, by that I mean voters and taxpayers engaged so that we embrace these technologies as quickly as possible. Uh, with that said, you mentioned this albedo thing. I am, you guys, I am very skeptical of this idea of putting sulfur high in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight into space. But the people who are studying it, one guy is a mechanical engineer, uh, are doing it not because, not necessarily because uh, they're technocrat know-it-alls, but because people are really concerned that maybe this is just going to have to reflect sunlight like crazy, or we're going to be in huge trouble. And uh, you guys know the hockey stick graph, right? Michael Mann is a friend of mine. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. <laughs> anyway, his latest book uh, is there's not this fragile moment. He studies ancient. He studied ancient climates using all these so-called proxy methods of stromatolites, pond scum, uh, tree rings, and then the ice. The ice, you know, when you go to the ice cores and get ancient uh, water uh, and look at the neutrons and oxygen atoms, you can really determine the temperature of the sea surface and the temperature of the world in ancient times. <clears throat> now, all, using all that data, we're living at this extraordinary moment. And there is not, according to the latest computer modeling, there's not going to be this turning point where everything goes to hell all at once. Instead, it's just going to get worse and worse, hotter and hotter, bigger and bigger storms, the Gulf Stream slowing downer and downer and downer uh, over the next few decades, unless we do something. And one of the cool ideas that I was really charmed, back, which I, charmed about, which I think you alluded to, you know, is making the wakes of large cargo ships bubbly and they'd reflect sunlight into space and there'd be the International Bubble Space Reflection Regulatory Agency <laughs> and we would uh, control, manage the albedo of Earth with all these extraordinary methods but also with the wakes of very, very large ships. It's a cool idea but it would take so-called top-down management. People would have to believe that it was worth doing and then really pursue it. But I love, of course, I love ideas like that. But first, you guys, we have to get our governments on board, engaged, going. And people say to me, Bill, Nye, science guy, what can I do about climate change? And I always say two things. Talk about it. If we were talking about climate change, the way we talk about all these other problems, we would be doing something. If we talked about climate change, the way we talk about gun violence, which is an important issue, man, oh man. But if we were talking about it at that level, we would be doing something. And then the other thing I say, you guys, is vote. Vote. And if you don't want to vote, if you think your vote doesn't count, would you just shut up <laughs> and let the rest of us who want to do something get her done? And, you know, I used to say, thank you, thank you. Richard, I used to say, I know you're, you're not a U.S. citizen, right? Way to go. Uh, but uh, I used to say the most important election in my lifetime was 2000, when, uh, when uh, Bush II beat Al Gore. And uh, Al Gore, well, didn't, Al Gore, Al Gore won the election, but did not become president. Yeah. Because if he had become president, we would have done something. I mean, we would have done non-zero about climate change. And there's a chance, of course, we wouldn't have in invaded the wrong country and tried to kill the wrong guy. There's a lot about that. But um, uh, uh, 
this is a really important time. And, and uh, now I say to everybody, 2024 is the most important election in history. And I know there's some uh, Canadians here, even woo, uh, uh, glorious and free. Uh, even if you're not in the United States, this election affects everybody in the world. So vote. And you can hate me. You can hate everything. You can be an everything hater person. But vote in this election and take the climate, the environment, into account when you vote. Please. Pity that, about uh, the Electoral College. Oh, uh, well, that would be great. You guys, sorry, I mean, it would be great to get rid of the Electoral College. Longest journey, single step. What we can do is get state legislatures to acknowledge, the, or rather, uh, pass laws to get all of their electoral college votes to go to the winner of the popular vote. If we do that for a few elections, then eventually we can abandon the electoral college. But everybody, yeah. as long as the system is the way it is, you know, Mitch McConnell ain't letting go, okay? And, uh, and not to, I don't blame, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, they have four senators. California, which has more people than Canada, by a little bit, has two senators. I mean, it's, so the appeal is play fair, you guys. Let's play fair. So-and-so won the popular vote, so let's have all your electoral college votes go to that, and it's going to take a few cycles to make changes. But, you know, it was proposed, 1970, almost. I was alive, almost. And the uh, what I would like, while you guys are out there, uh, every few weeks when doing the Science Guy show, every few weeks somebody would send me their blues song about DNA, for example. Their, their own band has written a song about DNA. Great. Uh, I'll just say, I'll just tell you all, writing the lyrics is not easy, but it's not that hard. It's the melody that sells songs So when you're doing that. And what we need is a protest song. We need some big-time rock guy, Conan Gray, Taylor Swift, to write a protest song. Because I was in middle school uh, at first, and then I was in high school when the Vietnam War was going on. And when I was 17, I had a very low draft number. And I was really anxious about going to Vietnam because it wasn't, both of my parents were veterans of World War II. My dad was a prisoner of war. My mom was one of the code girls uh, who broke the, she single-handedly. No, she <laughs> was a cryptographer. What did you do during the war, mom? Can't talk about it. Ha, <laughs> Never found out really what she did. My wife found out more about what she did than I did, and um, uh, than I ever knew. And uh, uh, I was brought up with this tradition of service. If there's a big deal war, you go fight it. But the Vietnam War was different because nobody, people my age, didn't think it was something we should be involved in. But then when I was 18, my draft number went way up. <laughs> but in the interim. And I didn't get drafted. But in the interim, the protests against the Vietnam War were enormous. I, I grew up in the city of Washington, D.C., in the city limits of Washington. You know how people from Michigan do this? I grew up in the city of Washington. And uh, there was one day you couldn't drive. All the streets were just covered with people. And sure enough, that protest ended the war. So we can do this, everybody. We can get enough people on board for climate change, for changing our political system to make it more fair, we can do this. And peaceful protests are part of, part of the equation. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd run for president, Richard, but you want somebody who likes that stuff. You know, people's, the reason our Congress and Every country's uh, legislative bodies are made up of lawyers is because they like laws. They think it's cool writing, uh, writing um, policy. But we do have a problem right now where the people in Congress, this is like the best job they're ever going to have, <laughs> and they're just throwing it around without quite understanding why they're there. Back to you. 
What about, um, talk about um, nuclear fusion as a, as a... As you know, I am, pun intended, all hot for nuclear fusion. <laughs> when I was, you know, in school, it was always 40 years away, 40 years away. Uh, you guys, I'm a mechanical engineer, and if you want to get to me, if you want to make me feel bad about myself, Bill Nye, he's no scientist. He's an engineer. Okay, mechanical engineering is just classical physics. That's all it is, man. And I went into mechanical engineering because I think bicycles and airplanes are cool. That's my deal. Anyway, uh, uh, fusion would be all particle physics. And the thing that's changed is now we have computers, artificial intelligence, that can adjust these magnetic fields fast enough to contain them. And the hilarious uh, turn of phrase is controlling a plasma. This is a gas that's so hot, all, how hot is it? It's so hot, all the electrons are dissociated from the atoms. And it behaves in a way that's not like the conventional three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. They behave differently. And so containing them is like trying to contain jello with steam. You know, it's a very difficult problem. But now it looks like there's so many organizations, government organizations, private companies, and academ academic uh, organizations that are working on this, it looks like somebody's going to figure it out. And if, that, if we could do that, it would change the world. We would have limitless electricity. If you had limitless electricity, you could do the big bills, big three things, clean water, Renewable, reliable electricity, the base load when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, and, um, and then access to the internet for everybody in the world. And the reason you want access to the internet is to provide education. When you can provide education, you raise the standard of living of women and girls. And when you do that, everybody's life is better. You know the old saying, thank you. My mother said all the time, happy women and girls, happy life. And, but as much, there's much in that. I, it's not my idea, but it's very well documented or proven. So let's go. I'm very excited about nuclear fusion. And the one that I'm hot for, although people have disabused me of it, is this company in California called TAE Industries. It used to be Tri-Alpha Energy, using boron hydride gas, whatever that is, and you run, that boron has five protons and hydrogen has one. You'd run protons into it and you'd get, um, Mr. Spock, you'd get, you'd get three helium nuclei. And that would be release all this heat and you'd capture it in conventional um, heat engine fashion. And you'd have a running turbine and you'd have electricity. It'd be very cool. And if it doesn't work, I still think it's worth investing in to see about this magnetic field, if we can manage magnetic fields. Insofar as you can find scientists who oppose evolution, I find engineers are the worst. Oh, I'll well, go for, man, yeah. no, uh, you know, as Neil deGrasse Tyson points out, if you're looking for a scientist who's a good atheist, <laughs> that's not that hard. Finding an engineer that's an atheist is a lot harder. Yeah. There's, no, it's a different tradition of of people who are uh, from industrial families that worked in industry and have uh, and grow up in communities with a lot of uh, fundamentalism and so on. No, there's much in what you say. Yeah. yeah. I ap applauded your debate with Ken Ham very much, but I myself have always um, fought shy of it. I, I was advised by Steve Gould, um, who said, don't dignify them by appearing on a platform as a scientist with them because it makes the audience think that they are true scientists who are um but i think you did the right thing um wow thank you but, i but, thought you'd tell me it was the worst thing that ever happened no, but i mean <laughs> the, there is i mean the the case that steve gould was making i think is a good one um but it's not so overwhelming and, and I, so i think well we're, here's the thing you guys about that debate is there anybody here who hasn't seen it, and memorized it, and watched it several times? <laughs> Everybody, I was advised by in conventional debate coaching 
fashion. Bill, be sure you go first. Go first. And kids, everybody, my friends, no. Uh, I love you all, but that's in a conventional debate. In this thing, my claim is my audience was not the debate coaches or the debate judges or the people in the audience in Petersburg, Kentucky. My audience was on the internet in the world. And so I won't say I largely ignored what Mr. Ham was saying, but I didn't address every one of his inane, just odd points over and over. Uh, instead, I presented conventional science-based uh, uh, arguments against his extraordinary, just weird <laughs> worldview. The Earth is 6,000. Mr. Ham, there are trees that are 10,000 years old. <laughs> are you high? What is going on? Dude, dude, dude. And so uh, uh, that thing, that debate has had now officially in August 10 million views. And so, thank you. And so in the internet world of, uh, of media, it's estimated that when you have 10 million official views on YouTube, you have about four times that many unofficial views. So somebody's watching it, and they're all not uh, young Earth creationists. So I, I feel that the right people are watching it, and I stand by it. One thing that happened that I did not anticipate, I'll admit, is the way they manipulated money. I looked briefly into the laws of Kentucky and the way their funding of the Creation Museum, which is his earlier facility, it's still there, heavens, heavens, pun intended, uh, in, um, it's still there in Petersburg, Kentucky, and I didn't think that they would have the money. No matter how well this thing went, they'd have the money, but they had this, what I would call it, financial trick with this Cross, Cross Creek institution. They moved money around in a way I didn't anticipate. But they also had a creationist governor, and they had a tourism board that was all creationist. That was, that's a governor-created tourism board. And it's in Grant County, and they gave all these crazy tax breaks to the businesses there. But they did eventually get nailed on, on um, having their employees sign on to being, uh, I, walk in, I walk in faith with Jesus Christ or something. They, they couldn't pull that off. They couldn't get their employees having to sign that. And they do a lot of bad. They do a lot of bad. But the worst thing they do is they're, education or miseducation about climate change. I mean, it's all bad, but that's the one that really gets my goat is this thoughtless, silly, inane climate change stuff. So if you watch my debate, I just want to 6,000 winter sun cycles, I mean, uh, winter summer cycles, <laughs> over 4.5 billion years. Dude, no, this is not working out. You're crazy. You're just crazy. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, we'll see what happens. Stay tuned. Back, thank you for your support of that, Richard. Thank yeah. you. Well, OK. Um, I mean, you, you get the point Steve Gould was making. It's quite a, quite a different point, that, that they can claim that because a scientist sits on a platform with them, they are somehow on equal terms. The way he put it was... Oh, yeah, that's a problem. They, they've won the moment you agree to appear with them, let alone even if you wipe the floor with them. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And he would never come to a debate here or in New York City or some, you know, civilized place. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I went into the lion's den to make, to put that evidence yeah. on the internet. Yeah. That was why I did it. Well, and well done. Congratulations. Yeah. I, I, um, yeah. Oh, and Jeannie. Let me thank, oh heavens, uh, let me thank Jeannie Scott and her colleagues. She was running the show at NCSE. Uh, she gave me just, just spot on specific great advice. And I'm wearing my Planetary Society pin the way anybody would. But I was also wearing my NCSE 
Penn, my uh, Center for Science Education, Penn, uh, because very proud to have done that. So thank you, a shout out to Jeannie and her colleagues. Well, let's talk a bit about science education. Um, how, how could we get it right? How do we, how do we get it wrong? How do we get it right? Well, everybody, uh, about half of what we learn in, about science, for regular people, you learn what they call informally. And informal science education is a technical word. It means out of school. I mean, it's an official legal or science education expression. And so we want, for me, uh, we wanted, I wanted to make informal science education uh, as accessible as possible. So I, you guys, you may have heard the story, but I'm of a certain age, and I was in the workforce working at Boeing and then at this shipyard. I worked at this company that made the premier oil slick skimming boat for a while. And, uh, and, but that, I got to tell you, it was just too low tech. I left that and went back into aerospace at a company called Sunstream. They made, now it's Honeywell, made the black boxes. But when I was working professionally, the US produced both the Chevy Vega and the Ford Pinto. <laughs> took solar panels off the roof of the White House and abandoned, officially abandoned teaching the metric system. And you guys, I was very, very concerned about the future of the US. Of course, that's done. No, very concerned about the future of the US and uh, came across this very compelling set of studies that 10 years old is about as old as you can be to get the so-called lifelong passion for science. And I think it's about as old as you can be to get a lifelong passion for anything. You know, if you talk to a journalist, he or she got excited about storytelling long before they're 10. You know, they love stories, storytelling. And so there's reference earlier to kids' books. That's, that's when you get people when they're under 10 or 10. Well, if it's not 10, it's 12. It ain't 23, you know. And so uh, that's why we aim the Science Guy show at people that age. But it turns out 10 years old is pretty good for a lot of people. <laughs> the difference between a 10-year-old and a grown-up, as far as their ability to reason, isn't all that difference. It's the experience that's the big difference. So um, what we want to do, I guess, Rit Richard, is advocate for science education as much as we can. And you know, it's very common go to a cocktail party, whatever, and, oh, you're a science guy. You know, I never liked science. I didn't really study this, but I didn't really get this. If you went to a party, I never really liked the alphabet. Yes, yes. yes. I, I didn't want to, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I had to memorize the alphabet. That was, I mean, we'd all go, that's crazy. And so uh, I guess we chip away at this, you know, trying to solve this problem of getting, creating a scientific and literate society here in the world's most, technically sophisticated. Okay, you could argue that it's not. Well, it's the most influential culture. And our technical, US's technical and science achievements are extraordinary. And uh, that's because of our science education. And what's happened apparently still at the top, the people in the US and Canada who are graduated from the first rate institutions still are the world leaders. And people come from around the world to go to the extraordinary institutions here in the U.S. and Canada to get educated, and then they go back home often, but uh, or sometimes they want to stay. That's still going great, but getting the regular people who work for a living to remain engaged in science is a really difficult problem. So why we have this convention, as I understand it, is to engage as many of us as possible to go out as Carl Sagan, many others said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So go out and tell people how exciting science is and the process of science. But the challenge is fighting that frustration. Mr. Ham, dude, sir, really, what are you thinking? You're not thinking. Stop it. And so uh, we got to all be disciplined about interacting with people. And um, one of the things, boy, you guys, I, I got recognition of this earlier, and I'm new to the game. I just finished uh, The Swerve about the nature of this poem, the nature of things, where this guy in 50 BCE 
speculated quite accurately that there are atoms and there's no God. And when you're dead, you're dirt. And isn't that cool that we can understand all that? Uh, and uh, uh, it's really quite an insight. And so we want people to, to get this, this excitement. Yes, we have these huge challenges. Yes, we have these great difficulties to face, but we have the means to deal with it. We have science. We have this process, this body of knowledge with, that enables us to recognize these problems. Just think if we had the climate changing like this and we didn't know why, whoa, that would be scary. And it is a scary time, but we have the means to address it. So everybody, let's go out and be in love and tell the world, let's, we can do this. But it's not just scientific knowledge. There, there, are, there are numerous people who believe the most ridiculous things as a kind of tribal. I mean, they believe that Hillary Clinton's running a pedophile ring out of a pizza parlor. They believe in flat earth. Oh, they man. Believe in, um, how can we do something about these extraordinary um, aberrations, yeah. which, are, which seem to be some kind of tribal... They're internet tribes, I think. They're not, yes. they're not local tribes. They're internet tribes. Um, so you guys, you're... Many of the people who spoke today are experts on this. How do we work with social media to combat the misinformation on social media? And I got to say, as a couple of people brought up, the pandemic really took me off guard. I went to elementary school with a guy who had polio. You do not want polio. People, no. And the reason, I, I, when I was a little kid growing up in Washington, D.C., Relative humidity, 99%. Fahrenheit, 97 Fahrenheit, 35, 40 Celsius. And we couldn't go swimming because of polio, this waterborne virus. But then when I was in long about third grade, the polio virus was around. Went and took the sugar cube. Cool, don't have polio. How could we have this? In the US, in Canada, to a small extent, Western Canada, how could we have this, this thing where people didn't embrace vaccines? And I gotta tell you- Not just didn't embrace, mystery. but active hostility. It's a real uh, mystery, you guys, but let's fight the fight. Let's stay with it. And you know, of course, to the extent that you can, be respectful of the other point of view. And keep in mind that the first time somebody hears Astrology is bunk. The first time you point out there's no ghosts, that's, that somebody else got your dead aunt's phone number and they're calling your phone, it's not your dead aunt. The first time you hear that, you reject it. The person rejects it. We've just got to stick with it in disciplined, to the extent possible, patient way. And I strongly believe that we will prevail because you can't, you can't get on a plane and have a successful vacation if you think the world is flat. <laughs> You're not going to get there. You will, you will get lost. And so we can do this, you guys, but I admit it is a, a deep challenge, Richard, a deep challenge. My problem is I cannot summon up any respect. I mean, how Oh, that's it. I'm right there with you, sir. Mm. I mean, I was on stage with... Can, did we mention Ken? I was on stage with that guy just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so they've got, they have saber toothed tigers running around with uh, stegosauruses. You guys, no. A saber toothed saber -tooth tiger, I misspoke, I'm sorry, saber toothed cat. Dude, that was an old slip of the brain there. Uh, uh, they were cats, not tigers. Uh, they, they were not vegetarians. They're, I mean, Look at their dentition. <laughs> and just this, uh, on and on and on with this guy. But uh, it's easy to go down what everybody loves to say now, rabbit holes. It's really to get distracted, e easy to get distracted. But we've got to stay the course. This that I mentioned, this next election is it, everybody. This is if we let this go sideways, uh, it will be if we let the lowercase l liberal democracies die it will kill us all. 
but this is science is the key to our future. So, uh, so let's go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've had the most inspiring evening. Um, thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for this, you all. This, talk about extraordinary. This really is extraordinary. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks, Paul. Oh, that, there we go. Thank you. Together, we can change the world. Let's go. Thank you. Bill Nye and Richard Dawkins, ladies and gentlemen. One more time for Bill Nye. Thank you. It's a lot of gravity in here. All right, everyone, that's day one of PsyCon. Was it a good day? All right, we'll see you all tomorrow, bright and early, 8.45. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends, and leaving a review.